to the title Mighty God. Since we were unable to worship in our sanctuary last Sunday, I am recapping some of that so that we will be able to move ahead in our focus with understanding. Our scripture today comes from the prophet Isaiah, the 61st chapter, as we hear from Isaiah once again in the midst of Advent. The Spirit of the Lord God is upon me because the Lord has anointed me. He has sent me to bring good news to the oppressed, to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives and release to the prisoners, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor and the day of vengeance of our God, to comfort all who mourn, to provide for those who mourn in Zion, to give them a garland instead of ashes, the oil of gladness instead of mourning, the mantle of praise instead of a faint spirit. They will be called oaks of righteousness, the planting of the Lord to display his glory. They shall build up the ancient ruins. They shall raise up the former devastations. They shall repair the ruined cities, the devastations of many generations. And resuming with verse 8 in the same 61st chapter, For I, the Lord, love justice. I hate robbery and wrongdoing. I will faithfully give them their recompense, and I will make an everlasting covenant with them. Their descendants shall be known among the nations, and their offspring among the peoples. All who see them shall acknowledge that they are a people whom the Lord has blessed. I will greatly rejoice in the Lord. My whole being shall exalt in my God, for he has clothed me with the garments of salvation. He has covered me with the robe of righteousness. As a bridegroom decks himself with a garland, and as a bride adorns herself with her jewels. For as the earth brings forth its shoots, and as a garden causes what is sown in it to spring up, so the Lord God will cause righteousness and praise to spring up before all the nations. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. As we focus today on Everlasting Father as the Messianic title for this Sunday, and we refer back to last Sunday's Messianic title, Mighty God, we are actually focusing on something that is essential to both of these titles, Mighty God, Everlasting Father. And that is in relationship to Jesus Christ, as he is the fulfillment of these titles, we would refer to his transformative power. I hope this message will help bring us to an understanding of what transformative power is for Christ and for the body of Christ that is the church. Now we refer back to mighty God as we re recollect that in the gospel according to St. Mark, there are two very powerful stories that reveal to us the nature of how Jesus is the fulfillment of the title mighty God. The first one that you will see an image of today is of Jesus and the man with the unclean spirits, found in Mark 1, 21 through 28. As Jesus casts forth out of this man this unclean spirit, he does so early on in his ministry to establish the reality that his power is to be transformational. It is applicable to those who follow him to their minds, their bodies, their spirits, and their relationships, to the wholeness of what it means to be created in God's image. So Jesus would speak to the wholeness of that person. And in this story, this individual is with an unclean spirit. Now we do know that this is often a reference to demonic possession, and in the context of the ancient world and in Jesus' day, these spirits, so-called spirits or unclean spirits, would have been very much connected to how we would look and examine mental illness in our day and age. And so as this spirit is approached by Jesus and confronted,
confronted by Jesus, Jesus displays the transformative power so that this man's spirit is renewed, mind, body, spirit, and relationships are restored, and he has a rightful place back into the community setting. The other story that we find in the Gospel according to St. Mark is the story of Jesus and the disciples in the boat. And the image that you will see reminds us of the very nature of why this was so essential as an event in Jesus' ministry. Those who are his disciples find themselves in a boat upon an angry sea. A storm has blown up and Jesus is asked to do something to bring about a restoration of peace in the midst of this storm. And Jesus reminds his disciples as he reminds us that we must have faith. And in extension of his hand across those seas, the storm is calm. As Jesus would calm the storms whirling all around us, as we are gathered today in this setting of worship. Now both of these stories reveal how Jesus is transformational in his ministry and how he speaks to the reality of human circumstances and events. We have all found ourselves and even now as we are gathered in worship, we find ourselves in the midst of storm. The storm that whirls around us in our nation in relationship to the current election. The storm that whirls around the pandemic. The storm that now whirls around issues related to those who will be receiving hopefully inoculations in the coming days that will render this disease and defeat it in the process. We are in the midst of storm. And so we need a Messiah who is transformation. Now, referring back to Isaiah, we remember that these oracles were in relationship to the coming of a king, an earthly king that will restore Israel to its healthy place in God's creation. But as we examine these titles, Mighty God and Everlasting Father, in relationship to Jesus, we find that in both instances, the story of Jesus and the man with the unclean spirit, and the story of Jesus calming the storm, that the key word is obey. The unclean spirits obey, and the sea obeys Jesus. And we find in both instances, the instance of the unclean spirit and the instance of the storm, that they are forces of chaos and death. And so Christ as the fulfillment of this messianic title of mighty God is reminding us of the reality that God intervenes. He intervenes in human life and human circumstances to overcome chaos and death. And this will ultimately be seen in the person of Jesus Christ, in his life, his teachings, his ministry, his death, and of course, in his resurrection. Because Jesus is the giver of life. So as we connect Jesus to the fulfillment of this title of mighty God, we do so reminding ourselves that Jesus is the giver of life, performing on behalf of the very creator God who has given us life. And so, we must equate and understand that Jesus as the giver of life is equal to the power of God for life. And Christ reminds us, I come to give life abundantly. We cannot live by bread alone. He says, I am the bread of life. So as Jesus is the giver of life, he is performing on behalf of the God who has created us and reflecting in his very ministry the transformative power of God in him. That power is a power not of death, but a power for life. I had the great privilege.
privilege of studying in Rome during my summer in Italy. I was able to spend time at the Vatican, but also exploring Rome, its ruins, its history, and it's a fascinating city. I had the opportunity to tour the catacombs, and as you descend down onto the ground, as early Christians would have, being led by a torch into a space of darkness, just as light is before us this morning, or on this day, on this Advent Sunday, on this wreath and at this altar. So that light, penetrating that darkness underground, enabled us as we went and descended down into that catacomb to read upon the walls, Vite, Vite, Vite. Life, life, life. Because in the midst of death for us today, as it is true for early Christians, in the midst of death in the name of Christ, there is life. And we are called, we are called as disciples of Jesus Christ to be witnesses of that life-giving power of God. And that is what transformative power is. You will see the image of the butterfly. Many of us may very well feel like this morning, we're very much locked into the larva stage. We have not come forth as the butterfly yet. That's perfectly fine. As long as we know that our ultimate goal as the body of Christ is to not to stay in the larva state that the power of God is a transforming power so that we will be released majestically as the butterfly, as the symbol and the promise and the sign of life, transformed life. And so we move today to the image of the Messiah as everlasting Father. Mighty God, everlasting Father. We hear in the text that I read from this morning from Isaiah. This image of the one who is to come forth, reminding us that as Messiah, the Spirit of the Lord will be upon him because he is anointed by God to bring good news to the oppressed, to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives and release to the prisoners. And so, we know and understand, as we read this Isaiah text, that ancient Israel's focus and much of their appeal and their understanding of God was in the image of God as Father. God as the supreme Father and Creator. God who created us, Imago, day in his image. The God this morning that we affirmed in the Apostles' Creed when we stated clearly and affirmed our faith by the words, God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth. That image in the Creed is rooted in Israel's ancient understanding of God as but as that is revealed in Christ, once again we see the nature of transformative power. We move beyond that image to a greater and higher fulfillment of what it is that defines everlasting Father. And that is divine compassion. He has sent me to bring good news to the oppressed, to bind up the broken heart, to proclaim liberty to the captives and release to the prisoners. We find in the images associated with everlasting Father, not only the fathering image, but also mothering images as well. As Jesus weeps all over Jerusalem, he reminds us of the hand that would bring her chicks under her wings, so God brings us under his sheltering arms. 
He is a protector of widows and orphans. And we hear it in this Isaiah text that the Messiah is to be the fulfillment of that image. The protector of widows and orphans, the vulnerable, and the disenfranchised. Now, we know that the task of the king of Israel was to do fatherly deeds. He was to be concerned for the nation of Israel as a father would be for his children. He was to be a father of all. But we also know what political reality often spells out. And perhaps some of us today can even testify to the reality of that in the midst of pandemic. Countering earthly father with heavenly father. The everlasting father is the one who is to feed the sheep, to strengthen the weak, to heal the sick, to bind up the injured, to bring back the strayed, to seek the lost. And so in Jesus Christ, this image of everlasting Father is fulfilled ultimately in Jesus as Son. Now, if this messianic title of everlasting Father is applicable to the Messiah, and Jesus is the Messiah, how is Jesus the fulfillment of that title as the Son? We find Jesus upon the cross itself referring to the Father. Father, into my hands I commend my spirit. But the best translation of what he says is Abba. And the best translation of Abba is Daddy. So the formality of that title as Jesus addresses Father as Daddy, indicates the intimacy of the relationship that Christ has with this image of everlasting Father. I want to remind you that the Christ who was born in Bethlehem, the one in whose name we are gathered today in the midst of the season of Advent, did not embrace hierarchical titles. It was not his Focus, for his life to be focused on the image of an earthly king. So he fulfills the image of everlasting father as he takes up the task of what that Abba, that daddy, is to be about. So he reminds us of the gospel according to John, the 14th chapter, I will not leave you orphans. I am coming to you. And that image of the father, the daddy, who will not allow his children to be left orphan, is fulfilled in the reality of who Jesus Christ is. And that nature of Christ as fulfilled in the very servant attitude of Jesus is spelled out in the very power of who Jesus is was born to be in Bethlehem. Thomas Merton, the great spiritual father of so many faithful persons, has reminded us in his very words as he speaks to the reality of the Christ born in Bethlehem, that that Christ who was born in Bethlehem was born in the power of one who came in this way. The child, he says, that lies in the manger, helpless and abandoned to the love of his own creatures, dependent entirely upon others to be fed, clothed, and sustained, remains the creator God and the ruler of the universe. And as he is, he wills to be helpless that we may take him into our hearts and into our care. And so, this Christ, who is mighty God, who is everlasting Father, must be born anew in us and in our hearts today. 
And Merton goes on to say, for he has embraced our poverty in order to give us his riches. You see, we as the body of Christ today are to take up the part of the title of everlasting father that is everlasting. He has no hands nor feet but ours now. And we who are his children must find our joy and our missional energy as his body and being everlasting in our love and in our care for a world today that longs for the transformational power of the Christ of Bethlehem. In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, let it be so. And the people who are Woodlawn say, Amen.